So this is quite a spontaneous video. Sometimes when I make my Friday lessons, they're planned a long time in advance. Then other times Wednesday evening comes around and I'm thinking, ah, what am I gonna do for Friday's video? And it's been one of those weeks. So what I've done today is just gone with my instincts. And earlier in the week, I was listening to this record. It's the third self-titled Velvet Underground record. And I also finally managed to get round to watching the Todd Haynes Velvet Underground film, which is amazing. And if you've not yet seen that, you should definitely check it out. And all of this put me in a bit of a VU kind of a mood. So what I've done is put together a guitar arrangement of the track Candy Says. So I'm going to start by playing that through for you. And I'm going to take you through my arrangement, how I put it together. And I'm also going to talk about the guitar parts that you can hear on the original recording. So let's get started. This is the opening track on this album 
and it's one of several songs that Lou Reed wrote from a female perspective and they're all called So and So Says. So you've got Candy Says, there's one called Stephanie Says and I think there are at least a couple more, I can't remember the names off the top of my head, maybe someone can let me know in the comments. And the song has fantastic lyrics and Lou Reed of course well known for his lyrical genius but also musically this one is really strong as well and it's something that's a bit underappreciated with Lou Reed, it seems to often just be about the lyrics but he was an amazing all-round songwriter and this song has got an amazing chord progression, an amazing melody and that makes it a good candidate for coming up with a kind of guitar arrangement where I play the vocal melody on the guitar. And just a word on the tuning before we get started and I believe that on the original recording all of the guitars are detuned and that's very typical of Velvet Underground stuff. So the guitars are actually tuned down a tone or a whole step so that notes that you're going to need to tune to are D G, C, F, A and D and I did toy with the idea of doing this lesson in standard tuning but as soon as I did that then you seem to lose some of the vibe and the feeling of the Velvet Underground and it was nowhere near as good so I've gone with the original tuning so uh, apologies for that you just have to retune your guitars. Let me start with the verse chord progression and it is a particularly beautiful chord progression I think and I'm going to show you the chord voicings which I think are used on the original recording. I assume this is Lou Reed playing this stuff and it goes like this. Classic sounding, very smooth and satisfying chord progression. This, and um, we're in the key of E major. I'm going to talk about this um, as though we were in standard tuning. So, I'm calling this an E chord, though, of course, if you're D tuned, it's going to be sounding as a D chord. Um, so, starting with this chord, E major, um, all of these chords are bar chords with their roots on the sixth string or the fifth string. So, we've got a sixth string root E major chord, that's our one chord. Then, we've got this chord here, this is a G sharp minor chord with its root on the fifth string. Uh, but what you can do is just cover the low E string as well with your first finger, and then you've got a D sharp in the bass. And you can hear with this chord progression that you've got this nice descending bass line happening. It's nice to have that in the guitar part. I can't really hear that on the original recording that the guitar is playing those low notes, but the bass has certainly got that descending thing happening. So we've got E major and then G sharp minor or G sharp minor with a D sharp in the bass. Then we've got this. So kind of an unexpected chord change here. It's a G major but again you can just have the low E string there in the bass, a D in the bass. And then we're going to a C sharp major, the sixth string root. And then we've got F sharp minor, B, and we're back home to E. So it's ending with a kind of two, five, one. And uh, in terms of the theory here, we've got the one chord and the three chord. Those are diatonic there in the key. Then we've got this G major chord, which is slightly unusual. Maybe you could hear that as coming from the parallel minor key from the key of E minor. And then we've got this, again, quite an unusual chord. It's a C sharp chord, but that's really just setting up the two chord, it's like a secondary dominant, it's like the five of two, and then we've got two, five, one. And you've got to realise that Lou Reed was steeped in the whole songwriting tradition and he was a professional songwriter before he got into the Velvet Underground and you can hear that in his chord structures and chord progressions. And really what Lou Reed is doing in his part is just strumming those chord shapes. So. something like that, just strumming up and down in your strumming hand, occasionally just adding in some little embellishments, so some sevenths and maybe some sixths and things in there as well. And on the recording you can hear a second arpeggiated part, and I'm assuming this is played by Sterling Morrison. I know that Doug Yule might have played some guitar on this record, but this certainly sounds like Sterling Morrison to me. And really he's just got a very simple but effective arpeggiated part, and really arpeggiating the same chord voicings that Lou is using, so two, three, so 
something along those lines, really just arpeggiating mainly the top four strings. Then for the chorus, Lou is playing this. We've got E to A, then down to F sharp major and B. That repeats. on the end of the chorus which is D to A and then B back to D and again it's an interesting chord progression we've got the one chord to the four chord in the key of E major then we've got this F sharp major chord and really I'm seeing that I'm hearing that as a secondary dominant he's not playing the seventh but it's kind of implied in that chord you've got this F sharp seven which is going to the B chord which is the five so really this is the five of five going to the five and then back to the one so very quite jazzy classic songwriting so that's Lou's chorus part and once again I think Sterling is just arpeggiating those chord voicings in a similar kind of a way Let's move on to my arrangement then and just talk a little bit about my approach when I'm putting something like this together. And I really just wanted to keep things simple and to try and stay true to the spirit and the beauty of the original recording. So I wasn't doing anything fancy in terms of chops. I wasn't kind of reharmonizing stuff and doing anything crazy. I was just trying to play the melody and then where possible I was trying to harmonize the melody with notes from the chord of the moment. So if you're putting something like this together you clearly need to know the song well, you need to know the melody, you need to know the chord progression and then you're going to need to have a certain amount of fretboard knowledge so that you can find different ways of playing the melody and then when you've got a melody note be able to find the chord that belongs to that melody note. So having a good knowledge of your basic chord shapes, perhaps of your caged system chord shapes of triads intervals all of that kind of thing and it's, it's, it's all of that stuff that I'm using in this arrangement let's start with the first verse and the basic melody goes something like this <laughs> bringing out that melody as best I could. So my first phrase went something like this. So you can hear I'm bringing out the melody there, but the chords here are E going to G sharp minor. So I started off by just establishing that one chord, playing an E chord. I've got a C grip, a C shape E chord here. Then the melody and I'm harmonizing that note with the chord of the moment, this G sharp minor. And I'm just playing a triad with that note on top. So from the A string we've got fret six, six, and then four. So and then the next chord is G major. And again, I think I'm just playing a triad here. And the next bit. So the melody is this. Underneath that I want to have this C sharp 7th chord, so I've got this a C grip 7th chord, got the melody notes in there already, and then you just have to lift up your little finger and depart from that chord grip to, to fit in the other melody notes. And then I've got F sharp minor. I've got another seventh chord in there. I'm thinking B seventh. I'm just bringing out the melody notes from that chord. A couple of melody notes on their own. And then we're back home to E again. So, so once again, thinking out of that C shape chord. And then just to turn that around arpeggiating a bit of a B major chord. So that's really the first half of the first verse. The second half I'm really playing pretty much the same thing. There might be a few little variations in the phrasing but it's more or less the same. So let me put all of that together. I'll play all of my first verse slowly. Thank you. 
Now for the chorus, I was thinking double stops in that R&B kind of Hendrixy vein. So my first phrase was this. <laughs> starting off coming out of that same E chord shape that I was using before in the C form and I've got these kind of R and B double stops happening so and then coming down to here so the second fret on the D and G and then up to the fourth fret with a little hammer on to the sixth then we're heading heading to that F sharp major chord so just going into that grip there so and then the next little bit so over my shoulder more double stops so the melody is nice and simple but on top of that I've got this D sharp note quite like that slightly dissonant major second sound so and then we go around again it's the same phrase and then we've got that little tag at the end of the chorus so we're on a D chord here and I'm thinking this D triad shape sliding up here into the A chord and then we've got this so using that same dissonant double stop that I had just now so there's the melody and then just ending with a high A note so I've chosen to play that at the 10th fret on the B string so all of the first chorus slowly goes like this structure of the tune repeats itself we've got another verse and another chorus and what I chose to do just to mix it up a little bit is to play the melody uh, an octave higher for the most part so my first phrase was so more double stops then I've got some sixths so sixths played on the first and third string so, so quite simple to play I'm just playing these with a bit of hybrid picking so my pick is on the lowest of the notes and I'm using my middle finger to pluck the highest note and you need to be aware of the chord that you're on at any given moment and often these six shapes can be seen as coming from the chord or from triad shapes so here we're on G chord we've got a G triad I'm just playing the two outside notes in that triad coming down to here both of these notes here are in the chord of the moment which is the C sharp 7 then we're going to F sharp minor, add some more six. Um, then just playing the melody here on the B string and into this little double stop shape. Just playing a little fill melody there that you can hear in Sterling Morrison's part. Then we're going round again for the second half of the second verse. So we got. So I'm now playing the melody notes up here. A little echo answering phrase to the melody. And more six as before. the F sharp minor and I'm playing so thirds this time on, on the top two strings so the two notes coming out of the chord shape and then back to E 
So all of that put together. And for the second chorus, I was really playing the same part as the first chorus, but an octave higher. So if you remember, the part was this. And if you know your fretboard, it's reasonably easy to just translate that up an octave. So I'm really thinking out of chord shapes again. So for the E chord. And then down, down to the A chord. This little double stop here, which is coming from the, the F-sharp triad shape, and then... So this is the same as before, really. There's the melody, but I'm putting that D-sharp on top. And repeats. And then... Uh, and then for the little tag at the end of the chorus... just double stops on the second and third strings and then um, so the melody is this and it's, it's really the ninth of the, the the B chord so I'm playing this little B9 shape here and then I want this high melody now underneath that I want a D chord so I've chosen to do it like that so open D string and then 14 15 and then 17 let me put all of that together for you the second chorus we've got really about it and for the outro section it's just two chords we're just going from an E chord for two bars and then to an A chord for two bars so I'm just playing around with some different voicings of those chords adding in some sevenths in there as well I think so E major 7 to A or A major 7 and then you can find those chords on the top four strings as well and this is where a little bit of jazz knowledge can come in quite useful and I was just using some drop two voicings on the top four strings maybe some inversions of those as well so if you've got an E major 7 for example you can play and you can do a similar thing with the A major 7th as well and something like that so just playing around with those voicings maybe I should do a proper video on these chord voicings if that's something you would be interested in but really just finding some shapes and arpeggiating them that was what I was doing in the outro section of the tune let me take you through the gear that I'm using in this video not an awful lot to say actually and I was just going for a nice cleanish tone I wanted it to be warm but with a little bit of brightness in there so it cut through the mix so I've gone for my jazz master I'm on the neck pickup and this jazz master is a 65 reissue jazz master from a few years back I think they called it the American 65 vintage jazz master and then I'm going into my Fender Princeton today with no pedals but I've got a little bit of reverb and a little bit of tremolo coming from the amp as well and you might not actually be able to detect the tremolo on the demo that I played at the start it's quite subtle but it just gives the guitar tone a little bit of movement which I quite like <laughs> Thank you.
that's it for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you're in the mood for more Velvet Underground, then I have done a handful of other Velvet Underground videos. I've done a video on Sunday morning, a beginner's version of Sunday morning, which was part of my beginner's course. I made that one quite a long time ago, but you can still watch that. And I've also done videos on Pale Blue Eyes and more recently Rock and Roll. And you should be able to find all of those on my channel if you do a search. And I will, of course, be tabbing out everything that I've discussed in this video. You'll be able to find that on my Patreon page along with my backing track. Thanks very much for watching. See you next time.